Hey, Critical Analysis, this is your video for your week six, chapter seven. So this week is chapter seven and chapter eight. This video will just cover, cover content in chapter seven. So for this, I have gone to the review folder, which is going to bring up the chapter seven PowerPoint, which I have going right here. I also have a couple tabs I'm going to be referring to up at the top, as well as I've opened the optional practices for chapter seven inference. So I'm gonna start off just by showing this visual right here. And if you've ever heard the phrase, like a picture's worth a thousand words, this is a, a demonstration of that. So looking at this picture, there are some inferences we can make. We can make a safe inference that there was a storm of some sort, that there was damage caused by that storm, uh, that it happened in a residential area, that maybe there's some unsafe you know, things going on right here. We might assume or make a safe assumption that it was a tornado of some sort or maybe some really bad winds. No, none of that is anywhere in here. It's not, there's no paragraph, there's no text. We are able to make that inference based on what we're able to see right there. So some unsafe assumptions might be something along the lines of this was a hurricane. We don't know that. We There's nothing in that picture to kind of support that. It does not look like they, they are in some kind of water-based area, water environment. There's no trees or marine life, anything like that. Um, the point is we can make inferences based on visuals that are provided to us. And that's what we've done here with this. So that's going to be part of the basis for what chapter seven talks about, talks about making inferences. And so throughout this chapter, we're gonna talk about what is an inference? How do we make those inferences? And then different types of language, connotative versus denotative, and then different types of um, figurative language, personification, metaphor, similes, that kind of stuff, and how, in, how to make these logical conclusions while we are reading. So here is an inference example. But a woman said, if you were my husband, I would take poison. The man says, madam, if you were my wife, I'd give it to you. Hopefully you can see that there is not a very healthy relationship there, that that is, they do not care for one another. We can, does not say that in there. It does not say, I do not like you. So what is an inference? It is meaning suggested rather than directly stated. So if someone implies something, they're hinting, they're suggesting, we talked about this with implied main idea. It's not directly stated. You have to use clues from the text or in, in the case we just saw from a picture to be able to form a conclusion. Sometimes we might call it reading between the lines. So readers use this, author's clues, author's hints, author's suggestions to be able to piece together the either what may, might be the main idea, it might be some kind of um, suggestion that the author has tried to give. So you want to try to be able to use those clues to come to conclusions. And they might do this in lots of different ways. That's what chapter seven will discuss is, you know, how are they making these implications? How are they implying and, and how are we then to infer it? So sometimes there, there might be humor. So an, an author might use cartoons or jokes to read the lines between the lines. This is where if you've ever had like political cartoons, if you've ever looked at those or editorial cartoons, um, there are literally millions of these online. I just literally typed in political cartoons. This is one of my favorites. This was written or drawn, I guess, during 2020. And so obviously this is Dorothy from Wizard of Oz. There's no place like not at home. And you can see the hand sanitizer, the toilet paper, counting down the months, you know, just really look frazzled looking. And so the implication here, what the author is trying to imply is that, you know, during that COVID shutdown, we were all going a little stir crazy, right? We were just, didn't know what was happening. Things were being hoarded. Things were being short. We just could not kind of get through that. So this is what this author was implying without very many words at all. This author did not have to say, the shutdown drove many of us stir crazy or cabin fever or anything like that. But this, these images allow us to pick up on that with a little bit of humor. Now, as you go through, I mean, there, like I said, there are literally, and, and no politician is safe from these. They're usually political in nature, even that like the editorial ones are usually more uh, political leaning. So tons of those. That is what authors can do sometimes when they inject humor is they're making implications for us as a reader to pick up. They might also use with something is called connotative language. So connotation is the feeling or emotion surrounding a word. 
versus denotative. Denotative is like the dictionary. So denotative dictionary is the denotative meaning of a word. Connotation is the feeling or emotion evoked. So if you're trying to use a word like tech savvy versus nerd, I'm just pulling those two words out. Tech savvy and nerd, they might mean similar things. However, nerds sometimes kind of portrays a different image. You might get a more or like a strong feeling or emotion tied to that word, good or bad, but others will use connotative language to try to evoke that you know, implication inside of their language. They may also use euphemisms. Euphemisms are like a substitution or polite way of saying something that might be indelicate. So for instance, if you got fired from a job, let's say, but you didn't really want to say that because it's kind of like a, a blunt way of saying it or it's embarrassing, you might say something like, I was let go. Same thing, right? It's just a mild way of saying it. So a euphemism is a substitution or a calmer way of saying something that might be embarrassing or harsh or offensive. Authors might use this. Along with politically correct information, um, so politically correct is whenever you are trying to be sensitive to a certain group of people. Um, and obviously this is usually one to be avoided. You don't want to offend people. So politically correct language authors may also use this. Figurative language. This is where figurative language comes into play. It's just a different way of saying regular words. And a lot of these you probably learned about in middle school, high school. So this is just going to maybe be a refresher. And this is going to kind of add a little bit of of, they call it like color, a little bit of wit or attitude or just kind of freshen up the language so it's not so boring. They're going to use figurative language. All Again, all of this can help us make inferences to try to understand more what the author is saying. So an author might use idioms. These are expressions that don't make a lot of sense. Um, if you are not a native English speaker, these expressions would really not make sense to you, such as, you know, they have cold feet. Okay, well, that does not literally mean they're feet are cold. That's something that someone says like right before someone gets married, they're cold feet, they're nervous, right? Raining cats and dogs. That literally does not mean outside that cats and dogs are coming down. It just means a very heavy rainfall. So that's an idiom, this expressive language that doesn't literally make sense, but it has a new meaning because of that. You also have similes and metaphors. Similes comparing two things using like or as. You know, she was as fun as a disco party. I don't know. Something like that, you know, using like or as where metaphor is more of a direct comparison. Um, she is the sun, you know, so comparing things without using like or as. So again, you've probably already been familiarized with figurative language over the years, but this is another way authors can inject that into their writing. Then you have hyperbole, which is like an exaggeration being more than it really is. Let's say that you, you know, paid 20 bucks for something, I don't know. And then through the, throughout the day, you want to get a little bit more sounding impressive. And by the end of the day, it's, yeah, I paid $2,000. You know, that's obviously a very extreme hyperbole. Um, my, I have an 11 year old and he's starting to get to the point where it's like, yo mama jokes are funny. And so those are great examples of hyperboles because those are really exaggerated jokes. Um, you know, your mama is so big. She sat on a rainbow and Skittles popped out. You know, it's a hyperbole. It's an overstatement. It's an exaggeration. So those are examples of hyperboles. And then on the other end of that spectrum is an understatement. It minimizes the point. Um, it, it's trying to kind of downplay something. From there, we also have examples of personification. It's when you are attributing human characteristics to non-human things. So like the stars are winking in the sky. Well, stars aren't human, they can't wink, but it's a nice way to kind of like fluff up language. And so when you're trying to give human characteristics to non-human things. We also have verbal irony. It's when you say one thing, and but you actually mean the opposite. If it's supposed to hurt, that's when it goes into sarcasm. You know, so verbal irony is when you say one thing, but you really mean the opposite. Like, um, you know, someone doesn't do a great job and you kind of go, great job there. You know, like you're, you're being ironic. Um, but then if you're really meaning to hurt someone, like it goes into a little bit of sarcasm. And then you also have figurative language. Our chapter does go into figurative language and poetry. I'm not going to touch on this quite as much, but these two slides talk about figurative language and poetry. And then there's also a section of it in your textbook. Going back to just pure inferences. So when we make an inference and, you know, an author can do all of these things. They can use figurative language in different ways, similes, metaphors, hyperboles. But no matter what they're doing, you need to make an inference based on facts. 
to, to look to see kind of what information is the author providing? What does the author leave out? In lieu of this, you also have to be aware of what's is called an absolute. When an author uses words like all, never, everyone, always, no one, because unless there's proof of that, it's dangerous to kind of use those words both as an author and then as a reader, just being aware. You know, if you said something along the lines of no one can afford the cost of college these days, well, that's not true. Some people can. So a safer way of saying that is not everyone can afford the cost of college these days. So whenever an author uses any of these words, unless they can actually say, you know, no, we surveyed a hundred people and every one of them said this, then you still have to be wary. You know, if they can't prove it, you have to be wary of these type of words. So again, going back to just the language, just a, a refresher, imply means to hint or suggest and infer is when we come to that conclusion. And so again, we always want to make sure that whenever we come to a conclusion, we make a logical conclusion, we are using support from the passage from the text. We can go back and say, this is why I came to this conclusion. You might be using different things such as descriptions. So an author may give you descriptions of people, actions, places to help you make a conclusion. They may have you con recall on your prior knowledge. You might also have to look at the author's like attitudes their uh, their actions, their choices, what are they not saying? All of these are just different ways to kind of come to those safe conclusions. Suggested meanings, prior knowledge, logical deductions, using hints as fact. Okay? So we're gonna look at a few more examples. That's the, the content of the chapter. Let's go ahead and look over here. Um, these are in the optional practices. I encourage you to take a look at these because this helps you practice a little bit more with those um, implied main ideas, if you will. So you can read through these and what conclusions can you draw based on the passage. If you want to, you can submit and check yourself. There's two of those there to test your conclusion making, but I'm going to go ahead and, sorry about that, I'm going to pull up right here. So if we look at this example, I found it in the middle of the sidewalk on my way home from school one spring morning. It was very tiny and it was hardly breathing when I picked it up. I fed it raw meat and other treats for several weeks. Soon it became strong and started to hop around. One day someone left a window open when I came home from work. I discovered it had disappeared. Nowhere in here does it say what it's talking about, but we might make an assumption that, okay, based on the clues, maybe they're talking about like a, a little frog, a little bird, something that is very small that is going to be able to hop away. You know, an illogical conclusion might be something like I had a student one time say kangaroo. Like that's not as logical in Ohio. Um, so what about this one? Dave had trouble removing the last spark plug from the car's engine. He wanted to check all of the plugs before he began working on the faulty carburetor. Nowhere in here does it say that Dave is a mechanic, but based on the clues, that's the assumption we can draw. That's the inference we can safely come to. Samuel felt sick to his stomach. His grade in the class was already low. Looking at his test paper, he knew he had a lot of work ahead of him before the end of the course. The safe assumption could be that he didn't do really well. He probably either failed it or got a D. He did not do well. Okay, so if you want to take a look at the last two on your own, you can try to kind of figure out what's a safe assumption based on those clues. And then underneath that are some paragraphs where, again, you're coming to a conclusion. Which one of these is a safe inference, a safe conclusion you can draw based on the actual proof that is provided? Again, that is found in the optional practices underneath here. Okay, let's look at one more. So if I had a couple of these, you know, if she died, I wouldn't go to her funeral. What's the inference that we can make there? Um, they probably didn't have a good relationship. As you give a speech in front of a large audience, you realize that people are laughing behind their hands and pointing to the region below your waist. What inference can we make? Uh, maybe your fly is down, you drop food. An unsafe inference might be I had someone one time say, oh, you went to school naked. Well, it doesn't say you're dreaming, so that might not be quite as a safe assumption. So just kind of look through here and see if you can come to these conclusions. Again, anytime there's optional practices like that, always feel free to send them to me via an email attachment or a Blackboard attachment because there is no Dropbox for them, but I am always willing to give you some feedback on them. All right, so that is the content for chapter seven. I encourage you to look through here, look through all of these slides that go over these, this language um, on your chapter seven assignment video. I talk about your chapter seven text and skill sheet. The whole front side is essentially asking you all of these questions. Um, it'll ask you things like what 
is connotative versus denotative? What is figurative language? Give an example of personification. What is hyperbole? Give an example. So you're going to want to make sure that you review these slides. You get into your textbook and you look at the actual chapter inside your textbook because chapter seven will give you some very specific examples of all of these types. There's actual additional practices you are welcome to look at and go through as well as it relates to all of these concepts. So I encourage you to take a look at those, email with questions, send me your answers to your optional practices, whatever is going to help you. So again, here we go. Chapter seven, you have all of these, you know, what is an inference? You have all this information on connotative language, extra additional practices. So as always, reach out if you need anything and I will see you for your chapter eight lecture.